Middle school. <laughs> the Rio Grande Valley really has a shortage as far as science goes. Now, my question for you is really, what words of encouragement could you give to these students? Because I know your education is in engineering, not really biology or physics or chemistry, but you still... I remind you, people, as a mechanical engineer, I took a lot of physics. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know you're a scientist. a lot of physics, man. I know you're a scientist, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm just saying, what words of encouragement could you give to the young people to get them more involved in science, uh, to go beyond what they might think they're able to achieve? Two things, three things. Uh, first of all, if you look at the captain of industry of most Fortune 500 companies, they were engineers. They are engineers. So engineers use science to solve problems and make things. Everything in this room was put here in general by an engineer or a machine that an engineer designed. It is uh, sobering. And that uh, was the he or she was able to do that through the process and body of knowledge we call science. The second subtle and surprising thing, the strongest indicator of whether or not a person will pursue a career in science is not science education, which, which, was, which is what I would have said. Turns out it's algebra. Uh, I didn't make this up. I, I, I'm the reporter. I, I'm the messenger. Shooting me is of no value. Uh, so, if we, I believe that if we just started teaching algebra earlier and don't make it such a make or break thing, or just make it a little more of a process, start in a younger grade so that by the time you're in seventh, eighth grade, you are more comfortable with letters representing numbers. That would be great. But the third thing, and grown ups say this to you guys all the time, you will surprise yourself. If you apply yourself, you can do more than you think you can. Uh, you, you can. Change the world. <laughs> so, let's do it. That's not the final question. Come on. Do we have to? We have to can we? When do we have to go? Well, let's just uh, just give me the next question. We'll take a meeting. Okay, hi, Mr. Nine. My name is Becca. I'm a pre-med major, and my question is. <laughs> Um, being CEO of the Planetary Society, what other projects aside from the laser beads project do you have for the near future? And also, what can we do in the community to contribute? I love you, man. So, <laughs> well, man, um, uh, what we're, the, a project that we're going to do, we are doing, is we're going to fly our own solar sail spacecraft. I didn't want to keep you up with this fascinating thing, but. It's crazy. It's a box this big. It's a standard used at universities called a CubeSat, cubicle satellite. And it, these sails come out that are bigger than this stage because they're made of this crazy, super thin mylar. It's a 50th of the thickness of human hair. It's cool. And uh, so we're flying that in 2015 and then again in 2016. We have two spacecraft that are pushed through space by the pressure of light. Wait a minute. I thought, photons have no mass, how can they have momentum? I know. <laughs> but they do. And it's by long tradition called solar pressure. And so this will be an independently built spacecraft that will enable interplanetary flight. And it was built by people like you. Then the other, the big thing we provide you is information about space, the news of space. And you know, no matter where you stand, no matter where you're from in the world, NASA, the National uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration, is the world leader in space. China's Chinese Space Administration just landed a rover on the moon. Very cool. But, uh, but NASA still leads the way. And so what we do at the Planetary Society is go to Washington, D.C. and lobby these guys. Like Senator uh, Congressman Culberson from, Tex uh, from Texas is very, he loves it. Well, uh, Amar Smith loves space exploration. So it brings people together from both sides of the aisle. It's very cool. But uh, the U.S. is not investing in it the way we used to. So we at the Planetary Society give you a voice in Congress. And then the big thing is check out our website. It's cool. We have journalists that are just excellent. People, you know, bloggers that are just first rate. So think about joining. I'd, I'd lo we'd love your support. We'd love it. Yes. Hi, Bill. My name is Edward. I'm um, an undergraduate, and I also work here at the planetarium. I was curious, me and my colleagues were wondering if you would 
have the opportunity or the chance to go by and visit our planetarium. I don't think this trip, are you open at 9 tomorrow morning? Yeah. All right, I'll come by. I'll do my best. All right. They have a schedule. Apparently, there's several other people on my flight. And, uh, I just keep your expectations low this trip. All right. But what are we going to be next trip? We're not going to be Bronx. We're not going to be Oslots. I'm just full of anxiety. Full shark. I know we're going to be the Ripper, but what are, they, what are we going to, what, doctor, okay, I'm not, I'm not worried about the name of the university. It's going to be great. I want a good mascot. Cobra. I know that. Yeah, I've heard about that. Brilliant. Or the what fish, the, the gar. Yeah. For this yeah. question, I'm going to ask Paul to come up here so that you can help translate. Oh, I. My first question Do you think a deaf person can change the world? Do you think a deaf person can change the world? Yes! <laughs> I mean, uh, are you familiar with Thomas Edison? I mean, without him, there's nothing but just that wouldn't be here. I mean, for crying out loud. Yes. Beethoven. And he apparently, he claimed that he was able to concentrate better than everybody else because he could, didn't have to all this noise all the time. That was his claim. And uh, not that it's the same, but Richard Dawkins makes the... Richard Dawkins, excuse me. Stephen Hawking makes the same claim that he is able to concentrate better than other people because he doesn't have distractions, which is extraordinary. So yes, of course you can change the world. Get it done. Thank you. Yes, over here. I'm a mechanical engineer. Yes. I'm just really inspired, like inspired by mechanical engineering in general. What are some words of advice you give to students, mechanical engineers in general, to help? Here's my advice. Get in if you can, whatever job you take. Whether it's a General Motors, uh, Texas pipe, uh, oil field, plastic, whatever thing you get in. Get in at the design, if you can. Get in at the beginning of a project. That's when you can have the most effect on it, and that's when you can really make it your own. It's really cool. Get in at the bottom. Even if you make a lot less money, it's worth with somewhat less money. Get in at the bottom. Yes. Take Jesus. Yes. Over here, man in hat. We can light years away. If there's intelligent life in those galaxies back that long, then wouldn't they transmit some sort of electronic signal or other intelligent life spectrum that we could detect? Would they? This is a fabulous question. So we have been listening for a radio signal from another world for about 50 years, half a century. We haven't heard one. Keep in mind, we invented radio a century ago. You know, Eiffel and Marconi are running around with towers and wirelesses. Just think how long maybe they were broadcasting, we weren't paying any attention. And maybe they came into existence and went out of existence in a, in a place far, far away long, long ago. Or maybe it's happening right now in a sense, but we got to wait 12 million years to even hear from it. But get this one. This is my favorite. Maybe the reason you ne we've never heard from another civilization is they did not pass the asteroid test. Yes, perhaps they did not have a moon. And they did not have two superpowers that emerged and made a bet with each other. I'll race you to the moon just because whoever gets there first wins something. And so they didn't accidentally get a space program. And so when an asteroid came, they were not able to deflect it, and they went, <laughs> and they got wiped out. What is it? On a Mac, it would be wipe. What is it on a PC? Is it still control all delete control all format? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it could be that that's the reason we haven't heard from anybody. And we at the Planetary Society would remind you 
as supporters of the optical search for a signal. We're listening for a light signal. There's one way to be sure you never hear from another civilization, and that's to not listen. Do, 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 do. <laughs> so we at the Planetary Society listen. Yes, yes, young man. Do you make science books? Do I make science books? Yes. The next one will be about space. And I'll have 12 demonstrations in there. You can make your own uh, spacecraft steering. You can make your own buttes or mesas, just like we have on Mars and the Earth. Yes, the next one's about space. It'll, be, it'll probably be called Bill Nye's Great Big Book of Space. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I understand that as a scientist you have the philosophy and, and um, urge to learn about things that you don't know and things that were in the past and are in the future and you want to discover and you, and you want to learn. So say you didn't have to do all the research and you could just... I know you don't believe in it, but ask an all-knowing being one question, oh. and know for certain one question, what would you ask? Um, there's two questions. Can I have two? <laughs> Can I have two questions that we've all asked? This is a pretty great question, woman in blue. <laughs> there are two questions that we have all asked, and if you meet somebody who says he or she never asked these two questions, they're lying. This is the same person as, oh, I don't like fried chicken. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no. Where did we come from? And are we alone? Are we alone in the universe? Is there anybody else out I mean, I hope it is astonishing to you that we can even ask the question. I've spent a lot of time with dogs. I've spoken to them at length about this. <laughs> Excuse me, are you ever paralyzed by self-doubt? <laughs> do you ever wonder what you're going to do with your career? <laughs> Have you thought about where we all came from and why we're doing it, what we're doing here? And generally what I get is, um, is there food involved? <laughs> That's generally what I get. Can we go for a walk? Squirrels, squirrels, squirrels. <laughs> so if you want to answer those two questions, I claim you have to explore space. You have to look out and beyond. And uh, if you meet somebody who says, I don't care, I don't care about exploring. That's usually not somebody you want to hang out with. Now, uh, this plane disappeared in the Indian Ocean, and it, I am first to admit it is much easier to explore the surface of the moon than the bottom of the ocean. But that doesn't mean uh, that, uh, that we don't need to explore. We should know all about the bottom of the ocean, and we should know all about the moon, and the objects beyond, and then we can determine more about our place in the cosmos, what I like to call our place in space, because that understanding, that reaching farther and deeper into space has changed us. We have recent ancestors who didn't know that the Earth went around the sun. They thought it was the other way around. And yet, when that was discovered, people were able to drive ships all over the ocean, and we all... Uh, met each other in different parts of the world and discovered that people are more alike than they are different. By discovering things in outer space, we learn about things on Earth. And if we stop exploring, what does that say about us? What does that say about you? Oh, I don't care what's out there. I don't want to know. I don't care where we all came from. I don't care uh, how we all got here. I don't care if we're alone. No! We want to explore space, we want to make discoveries so that we can, dare I say it, change the world!